What is going on, everybody? Welcome to Ares in the Nation. And hopefully you guys have seen my reaction to the Stormtrooper from Sabaton. Because this is going to be the history side of what we just reacted to. Alright, I understand that this will be the fourth video on the channel. Which means the notifications probably aren't on. So cheers to you guys for finding this video. Hopefully you listened to the end or the very beginning of that video. All right, and you made your you made your way here, but I cannot wait to learn, man. I can't wait to learn. I, once learning stops, what are you doing in life? You got to keep learning, and and this stuff, you know, over here we gloss over it. World War One, World War Two, those are massive subjects in school. So, like, there's a lot of stuff that is missed, and unfortunately, stuff that isn't talked about. So it's always good to, to increase your knowledge, to, to hear all sides of everything, guys. And I'm not saying they come with a side. Sabaton just says it like it is, whatever the case. Not glorifying or praising, just speaking. Just saying what happened. And I'm here for it. So let's do this. This is a 19, almost 20-minute video. Hope you guys got your popcorn ready because we're going to learn and I will, I will stop here and there. I'm not trying to make this no 30-minute video, guys. But I'm just ready to learn. If I have something to chime in, you know, I, I'm, I'm here for it. But, yeah, Stormtroopers. To me, I knew they were a reference to something, not just Star Wars. I knew they were a reference to something. I just never, never knew what. You know what I mean? Um, and, yeah, we're, we're, we're here for this. All right? And it makes sense. Makes sense. That little bit of info I pulled up before our Sabaton reaction, um, Stormtrooper reaction. What Stormtroopers were used for. They were like the the cannon fodder to to essentially either either their goal was to they always achieve their goal of breaking a stalemate. I'll put it that way. Whether they got into the enemy's lines and 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 did that or not. I don't know, but very effective, very new at the time they were implemented. It had to change the way um, generals and soldiers prepared for battle in in the trenches, because this is World War One. The the stormtroopers, the German elite of World War One, Sabaton history, one one nine official. All right, so I'm done. Uh, but anyway, so oh, that's that's what I was talking about. Stormtroopers in Star Wars use kind of similar, just kind of similarly. They're just cannon fodder, right? This, it makes sense. That's why they're called what they are called. Anyway, okay, here we go. Three, two, one, let's go. I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Joachim from Sabaton. And this is Sabaton History. Live from the Sabaton Cruise. Live from the Sabaton Cruise. <laughs> Hell yeah! Oh, shit. And this is Stormtroopers. And this is unfortunately, really unfortunately, not about stormtroopers a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Yeah. It's more, more recent, it's more earthbound stormtroopers, unfortunately. It was March 1918, and the Kaiserschlacht drew near. These German spring offensives were to be the final, all deciding battles that would win the Central Powers the Great War. So, all night, special assault squads shuffled into position. They were waiting for the signal to unleash a hurricane of extreme violence against their enemies, armed to the teeth and with iron in their hearts. They would pour through the weak spots of the enemy's defenses like, like a flood of metal and steel. These were the German stormtroopers. When Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff basically took over German high command in 1916, he knew that he needed to change things if they wanted to win the war. The traditional mass tactics were a thing of the past and had only produced huge casualties for little gain. To break the stalemate of trench warfare, he and his command figured they had to go back to the qualities of individual soldiery. By 1916, the idea of the Sturmtruppen had begun to take root within the German army, 
the year of the battles, as 1916 would be known, at Verdun, the Somme, and in Galicia, had again demonstrated the futility of throwing waves of men against entrenched defenses. The stormtroop concept offered something new, a cadre of highly trained, highly motivated, and highly specialized assault units. The original Sturmtruppes were brought to life in the mountainous battlefields of the Vosk, the Carpathians, and the Argonne. Here, the terrain did not allow for continuous lines of trenches, and the defenders had to build a series of separated strong points instead. Fighting in the confined spaces of narrow mountain paths favored aggressive shock troop tactics, and the first stormtroopers were great at circumventing enemy positions and infiltrating their perimeter before attacking from the flanks and the rear. Hmm. Outfits like the original Sturmabteilung Rohr were also developed from the playbooks of trench raiders and combat patrols, applying a deadly mix of shock, surprise, and ultraviolence. They would burst onto the scene and cause havoc among the defenders, but unlike regular infantry, the Sturmtruppen would not stop there, but keep on pushing through the trenches to create maximum chaos, maximum destruction. The emerging Stormtroopers attracted a certain kind of soldier, usually younger men, often under 25, wow. unmarried, and with a certain flair for recklessness and a, a disdain for death and danger. But there were also the older, more experienced veterans, professional soldiers, and cold, calculating killers. Physically, fitness was important for the job, as the demands on the body, well, they were high. But most importantly was their character. Each had to possess a certain dash, and a daredevil attitude. A single-minded determination was necessary to see advances carried out through total carnage and destruction. Wow. For in, in close quarter combat, there is no room for humanity. They would fight with daggers, clubs, trench tools, pistols, looking the enemy in the eye while punching, wrestling, killing. And this needed a certain type of man. With with unrelenting determination and iron in the soul, as Ernst Junger's writings would describe. The single strongest motivation was the Stoss, the push and shock needed to break into enemy lines. Unlike trench raiders, stormtroops, they were not there to capture prisoners or gather intelligence. Their sole objective was to clear a path and remove any obstacles in the way, living or otherwise. The mm. constant danger, the constant pressure, it formed a very tight bond between the men. They trained and lived together day by day, and they had to fully trust in each other's abilities. Each was a specialist in his own right. Wow. Now, many came from the German Jaggers and the newly introduced mountain units. Those guys were expert marksmen and recon specialists. Others had been pioneers, and their technical expertise in handling explosives and flamethrowers brought tactical versatility to the mix. There were also machine gun specialists, trench mortar and grenade launcher units. So. For whatever task lay ahead, the Stoss troop could be mixed and matched for whatever the situation demanded. Each man was, of course, well trained in close combat and trench warfare, as well as with a wide arsenal of both native and foreign weapons and equipment. Wow. They were armed with lighter carbines and machine guns like the MG0815, but the weapon of choice for the Stoss troop was the hand grenade. Going into action, they would carry sandbags full of stick and egg grenades with them. The first for concussion, the second for fragmentation. Emphasis was on accuracy and quickness of release. Each trooper would carry at least five or six grenades into wow. battle, often in bags slung around the neck and the shoulders. They were great tools to dislodge the enemy from fortified positions by bombarding loopholes and entrances. And remember, the storm detachments, they were not riflemen. They were not fusiliers, they were designated grenadiers. Many weapons were specially modified for stormtrooper use. The P-98 Luger 
well, it was perfect for close combat in general, but its small magazine was quickly depleted. The Stormtrooper Luger, though, was outfitted with a 32-round drum magazine, a longer barrel, and a shoulder stock. It was basically a semi-automatic carbine by that point. Even more effective was the MP18 submachine pistol. Firing 400 rounds a minute, Damn. it was the perfect trench clearer. A new uniform was also designed to suit the especially rugged service of the stormtroopers. This was outfitted with mountain boots and trousers with leather patches on the buttocks and on the knees. Over the years, the Germans would develop their stormtroop doctrines and ideas, but it was experimental by nature, a constant trial by fire, if you will. Equipment and weapons were, were constantly exchanged and rebalanced in order to figure out what worked and what did not work. But fighting on so many fronts simultaneously allowed the Germans to accumulate a large pool of knowledge and experience from their own forces as well as from their enemies, the French, the British, the Russians, they all deployed some sort of shock troops and, and death companies that were especially fierce in battle. Each mission, the Germans also study how the enemy had reacted to wow. their attacks. What, what was his modus operandi? How would he direct his reserves? And what weapons would he bring to bear? German high command allowed the stormtroop soldiers and commanders a great deal of freedom of decision in the field. If opportunities needed to be seized and momentum maintained, then there was no room for, for waiting or, or for second guessing. Now that's something that's that's interesting. Like right now it makes sense. Like, you know, to me now in this day and age that makes sense, you know. But back then, when everyone was like playing, let's say by rule books, everyone kind of shared notes and had this, uh, similar rule books. Um, there was no, there was no, let's say, freedom to make a, a snap judgment, snap decision. So that's kind of very unique. It's sort of like the, I guess, the Native American like guerrilla tactics that the U.S. used in like the Revolutionary War, the French and Indian War. Um, and that was revolutionary then too, is, you know, everyone was standing in line, first rank kneel, second, you know, second rank fire uh, and, and vice versa. That broke that real quick, the guerrilla style tactics. Um, so this is interesting. It's just very interesting that, that they kind of sort of forced a, a rule change in war. All right. I get that. That's, that's crazy. That's crazy. Cause over that, you know. I, there's, there's echoes of a black adder goes forth, right? And I'm trying, like, I'm trying not, to, I'm trying to suppress that, but that's just like the most current World War One thing I've, I've, I've seen, right? So that's like where my mind stops. I get to the most current little bit of information given to me. And that's where my, okay, that's where I'm pulling from. Instead of going all the way back to try to remember what was told to me and what I forgot in high school. All right, let's just keep going. I want to back it up just a little bit. Not going back I'm not going back too much. But it's just a, it's just interesting to see that though. The the how how war um how it progressed, you know? It's it's very interesting to see like you hit you hit the hive and see what what comes out, how they form, how what how they react. And then by that, you know, you get to know your enemy a little bit more. So all right. Opportunities needed to be seized and momentum maintained, then there was no room for, for waiting or, or for second guessing. Stormtroop tactics demanded decentralized leadership and low level command structures. Instead of setting a rigid and restricted set of objectives, the men were given just a, a broad goal and allowed to find their own ways as to how to achieve it. NCOs were not only allowed, but encouraged to lead through direct command and personal judgment, a concept which would later develop into the famed Auftragstaktik, mission tactics, which I've talked about in my World War II series. Here, success depended on the determination and the recklessness of the pack, personal initiative, the, the dash and drive of the individual. These were to decide victory or death. The stormtroopers soon had a certain image, a certain mythos. And both German soldiers and their allies and enemies began to take notice. For the allies, the stormtroopers became kind of a 
boogeyman. Sentries were paranoid about the idea of groups of Germans with trench clubs stalking the night. The men themselves certainly knew that they were elite. They got the best training, the best equipment, more weapons than any other outfit. They did not have to concern themselves with the woes of regular infantrymen. They were not there to hold the line. They were not there to prepare defenses. They were there to break in, to destroy the enemy and open a path. Nothing more, nothing less. After each mission, if they got back alive, they were rotated out of the lines and trained for their next assignments. A German medical officer recounts, the men of the storm battalions were treated like football stars. They lived in comfortable quarters. They traveled to the playing ground in buses. They did their jobs and disappeared again and left the poor foot soldiers to dig in, to deal with the counterattacks and endure the avenging artillery fire of the enemy. They were so well trained and had developed such a high standard of teamwork. They moved like snakes over the ground, camouflaged and making use of every bit of cover so they did not offer any targets for artillery fire. When an attack was ordered, the stormtroopers would gather in well-prepared forward positions, usually trenches and saps that offered the shortest possible way to the enemy lines. They assembled under cover of the night and in total silence to not tip off the enemy that death was lurking just around the corner. Once the signal for attack was given, though, the artillery would open fire, wrecking any pre-sighted points on the map. See, artillery was always an important factor on a Great War battlefield, but it was vital for the success of the stormtroopers. A sudden, violent barrage of heavy guns would not only destroy much of the defenses, but would also force the enemy to spread out and find cover in isolated groups, which would then become easy prey. Everything had to work like clockwork for maximum efficiency. The stormtroopers rose out of their trenches, running and jumping through the last meters of no man's land towards the enemy trenches. Like in the simulations, the troopers would break in just after the last shell had been fired. Violence had to be overwhelming from the start, and every second counted. Pioneers would push in with flamethrowers or demolish barbed wire with explosives. Grenadiers would throw flurries of bombs into the dugouts. Everyone bold enough to oppose them was to be cut down mercilessly. Trench mortars were brought in to deal with enemy strong points and light machine guns took positions to support the advance. Colored smoke flares would be fired into the sky to inform the rear of their success and then the reserves were rushed in with more grenades and more ammo. Wow. But in the end of course, victory was not guaranteed. After all, stormtrooper tactics were all about fluidity. If the attack promised success, then it would be further exploited. If not, it would be abandoned. Even the best equipped stormtroopers could run into insurmountable defenses or much stronger opposition than they had anticipated. Plans never survive the first contact with the enemy. That is the rule. But individual setbacks could not allow the whole advance to be bogged down, not even for a moment. Hesitation and unnecessary long firefights would allow the enemy to recover and regain his wits. The stormtroopers would have to always keep the initiative, always keep up the pressure, always push, always pursue. If one group failed, another would not try to overcome the obstacle, but circumvent it. There was always a different path in the maze of the trenches, and stormtroopers were to find and exploit the path that offered the least resistance. Get wow. in, wreak havoc, get through, wow. job done. Strike and save our world. I think some of you guys might have seen my friend Joachim around before, yeah? I play in a local band from Fallen. Uh, <laughs> but he's a, he's a singer, actually. He's pretty good. This time we're going to actually talk about the song. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> now, Stormtroopers, don't laugh. Okay, we're not going to talk. We're going to talk about breakfast. No, we're going to talk about the song. Uh, now, Stormtroopers, great topic. Sure, shock troops, always great. Everybody's interested. Why choose the German store troops as opposed to the Russian or Austro-Hungarian or, or, or even the Italian or, or French or when you're choosing 
Oh, it's actually a bit of a joke, internal one. Uh, a lot of people have requested we do a song about Star Wars over the years. Obviously, <laughs> I had to throw stormtroopers in there. Obviously, I mean, the Jaggers, uh, the Austro-Hungarians, would have been really interesting. However, that wouldn't work very well with the Star Wars joke. But the ice planet Hoth was named after Hermann Hoth, the, uh, the Panzer Army leader from World War II, who, if you watch my World War II channel, just lost his job in November 1943. So a <laughs> sad, sad moment for the ice planet Hoth. Okay, so, t so tell me about the, the genesis of the song and what you were trying to go, where you were trying to go with it. Uh, this is a really old track, actually. I started writing this 10 years ago, and I sort of never finished it. I really liked the verse and the drive of the song. I think it was for Heroes, actually, I started writing this one. So it's quite, quite old. 2013 when I wrote it. Did you never, did you never have an album it fit on, or did you just never finished the song, or how, how did that work? I, I basically gave up because the chorus sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I remember going through old material because after a while you're working with several songs at the same time when writing an album and sometimes you need some fresh input and do I have anything useful in my old pile you know maybe there's a verse or something in an older song I wrote that I could use for a, a new song and while going through some of this stuff I remember Pad who's sitting over there uh, came up running and it was the verse for Stormtroopers I think verse and bridge or pre-chorus and like oh that's that old world stuff i remember that that's a song that's a song and i'm like yeah but the chorus sucks ass <laughs> um, ass yes i, I, I could have I said something else that was the least offensive term i could come up with <laughs> well uh it, it uh, turned out then uh, pat was really onto it and i'm like yeah i like it too but i gotta rewrite the chorus then so we sort of agreed to okay you can remake the chorus and you know fuck around with everything else but don't touch that verse and pre-chorus yeah so um, that stayed in and it was actually one of the last songs to be finished for the album so it was wow. not a last minute thing really but uh I don't know, I just kept postponing it. And have, having started a song and written a, a chorus, it's sort of stuck in your mind. It's hard to get out of that and imagine something else in its place. But had it lyrically always been about stormtroopers? Or was it about something else originally and just changed the lyrics? Oh, there was just uh, random stupid lyrics. Uh, Can you sing some of them for uh, the crowd? I do it every night, man. <laughs> I mean, the, the original stupid lyrics. Oh, they're still the original stupid yeah. lyrics. No, uh, usually when I write music, and I don't know the topic, which is the case sometimes, I just do ran random rhymes or you know random words. I don't even remember them, actually. Are there any other of your more recent tunes from, say, the two World War I albums and stuff that, that are not recycled, but you know what I mean, refurbished songs like, like, like Stormtroopers? Oh, uh, good question. Uh, I don't remember from the top of my head, but every now and then, yeah, actually, uh, Attack of the Dead Men. Uh, me and Chris started writing that song in 2013 already, uh, but we had a shitty pre-chorus that we couldn't get away with. <laughs> so we had the verse, the intro, we had everything pretty much, except the solo and uh, the pre-chorus. And uh, it was a hard and technical uh, pre-chorus, and we just it didn't gel. And we got so frustrated and angry, and just said, it shouldn't be that hard. No. So we just went... <laughs> those few chords and that's when the yeah, dead that's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's, it's great. Again. Hey, um, something about that song, when I, when I play that on piano tomorrow, speaking of the solo, um, the first part of the solo, I kept the chords, but I had to change the solo. But once it gets to the bam, 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 bam that sounds brilliant on a piano. Oh, really? That's, that's like the most beautiful <laughs> part of any part of the album. I've actually fl flushed out like large chords, like big, <laughs> big ass chords to it. You, you'll like that. Well, my friends, that is all from Sabaton History Live this time around. I know, live, but this was fantastic. Hey, can we get a hell yeah? Hell yeah! Okay, and we should definitely do this next year and every year on the Sabaton Cruise. I hope so. Uh, uh, <laughs> hell yeah. No, this was a lot of fun. And if you guys have never been on the Sabaton Cruise, you should definitely come next year because you'll see all kinds of great bands and you'll see Sabaton twice and you'll probably see me doing something else again. Or this. I, guess, I got right? some cool plans for you. you got some, he's got some cool <laughs> yeah, plans man. for me, which means I'll be dead by the mooring. Okay, <laughs> see you next time.
All right, everyone, what are you waiting for? Click that bell, subscribe, check out oh. Indy's other channels. And Guys, that was so awesome. Not only do we get like a little taste of history, we also get this, this man's like creative process his journey how he chooses to write what he writes how, like where like i first for the longest time and this is kind of maybe not like okay historical band he must be like a massive history buff and i'm not saying he's not but it's interesting to see like i want to touch on this i'm going to learn about this and then i'm going to write a song about it and not just that keep writing that same song over and over and over and over and over and over again you know kind of like rehashing it re seeing if it works so it's not like one and done he sat on that song for a long freaking time man guys i'm here for this let's start unpacking all of it uh there's still a couple of probably of the history channel side stuff that i have to catch up on um that we've already listened to so i might just be releasing those individually but anyway guys much love thank you for jumping along on this journey guys um make sure you unplug do something legendary read some history and guys i'll see you in the next video guys later